Ken, I said all those wonderfully nice things about you, and I think I forgot to make this broadcast go live. So now it's live, and now you're really on here. Let me introduce to you, in case you have missed the beginning of this, uh, he is our cabaret cover boy. I should say cover artist, but I like saying cover boy. He is the wonderful star of Broadway stage, stages all over the country and film and television. He is the wonderful Ken Page. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Hello, Hi. hello, my love. Welcome to you, to me, Hi. to me, to us. To... <laughs> to all of it on this incredibly hot day. Oh, it's and... hot everywhere. At least we have that in common. We can say <laughs> that with everybody. Everybody's hot. It's true. And uh, boy, this summer is certainly no exception. But let me ask you, um, what did you do during the pandemic? How did you handle those pandemic months? Since that seems to be a question that everybody's really interested in. What'd you do? Yeah. Well, you know, first of all, I just want to correct one thing. And it's, okay. uh, it's on IMDB and all those other things incorrectly, yeah. I believe, in many of them. Actually, The Wiz was not my Broadway debut. <gasps> uh, Guys and Dolls was my Broadway debut. Oh, they have that flipped. Oh, they do. The, they yeah. do. And I tried yeah, to correct yeah. it and it's out there. But at any rate, because the wonderful gentleman Ted Ross originated the role of the lion and the whiz, okay, and I was well, in Guys and Dolls then. Okay. So, um, yeah. But anyway, that's just beside the point. Now, to yeah, the no, no, pandemic. No, it's good to know, actually. That, well, that, it is yeah. because, you know, it's that's what because it is. Because he but did course, it. And, yes, and that's, he, he did and it, and I was, did and I was it, doing yeah. something else. Yeah. And, of course, it's out there like that, so it's totally, you know, understandable. It was right. Anyway. Uh, you know, it was a very interesting process, the whole pandemic, because first of all, you had to realize that you weren't going to get to do anything. That was yeah. the first thing, that everything yeah. was truly, truly shut down. And yeah. there were many things that I was supposed to do from appearing in London with Nightmare Before Christmas concerts to things in New York, things in St. Louis, the Muni places I work and so forth. They were all, as we now know, shut down. Uh -huh. So for me, the first thing was just kind of, I think it took a good six months or more to realize that this was the reality, you know, that yeah. everything for live theater was not happening and not yeah. going to happen for a while, you know. And when uh, we first shut down, I remember thinking, I remember thinking, okay, it's going to be four weeks or so, and then we're all going to get back to where we were going. And then exactly. it really didn't sink in for quite a bit. So I hear that where you're like, okay, yeah. this yeah, is yeah. how it's it going to be. That's right. It took a minute to really understand the impact. Yeah. And when Broadway, because I was supposed to do Broadway backwards and everything was sort of bubbling up. And I called him and I said, you know what? I can't, I just can't come there right now to New York. Mm -hmm. It's just a little too much, you know, it's too chancy. And that weekend was the date, whatever it was, when Broadway actually shut down. Yeah. So I had already you know, stepped out. But at the same time, by the time the show was to actually happen, everything had been shut down, you know? Yeah. Um, so that was, I was poised to be part of, and that's why it was so impacting because it And really where were you? Me. Where was home? Where were, where, where were home you? was and is St. Louis, my hometown. Right. Okay. I live here yep. and I work out of here. Um, but I was here in St. Louis getting ready, as I said, to go to New York to do right. this, this thing. And uh, no flights, you know, all of that stuff was, of course, at the beginning of you don't get on an airplane, you don't. Oh, no, 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 no. Yeah. So it, mean, it just brought everything to a halt. I wish I could show you. I have. Sometime I will because I'm going to stalk you. If <laughs> I'm crazy about you. No, I right. love you. You know that. Ken, Ken showed up for us uh, in our very first gala, the 2017 gala for the American Songbook Association that was um, completely dedicated to the Black American Songbook. And I was walking down a hallway and uh, threw my arms out. We gave each other this huge hug. And then I looked at him and I said, wait a minute, do I know you? And he said, not really. But that's all right. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's you know, I, I'm a true believer that there are people you meet in your life and I'm very sensitive to this and I yep. pay attention to it, that your spirits already know each other. I completely yeah. agree. I completely and there are people, agree. just put it, you know, there are also people you meet where you know your spirits have met and they don't like each other. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and it's like you meet them, you go, Oh, it's you again. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, but you, you know, were one of those cases where I felt like I'd known you for years, all my life, you know, all my wow. professional life for sure. And Lucky. there was just a kindredness in our spirits. And, Immediately. Yeah. Immediately. Right away into each other's arms. Right. Well, we're going to make that, we're going to make that, we're going to see each other a little more, but Absolutely. I want to show you sometime the video that I have of walking uh, from my, my place. I live in Midtown West, right into Times Square and right down Broadway in May. And when I tell you that I did not see another car, 
It looked like a film set. Yeah. It, it was completely empty. Uh, I've never seen anything like it. In yeah. New York City, come to Hard our Hard to imagine. I remember seeing oh. uh, photographs and video things from people on Facebook. And me thinking, you know, I lived there for many, many years. Mm. And thinking to myself, I had never seen the city like that. No. And you could hear birdsong in the morning in a way that I'm sure New York City has not heard it. But right. anyway, the big question is, what's a nice boy from St. Louis doing having a career like yours? And I, I actually, the, one of the best parts of this job is that um, I get to really do a lot of research on a lot of very interesting people. And I yeah. found some wonderful things. But I want to know about the very, very start. For instance, did you come from a musical family? Not at all. Okay. Not at all. I think what I did come from is a family that was very, uh, for lack of a better word, very gregarious in nature mm -hmm. and also very uh, uh, receptive to and I don't know how to put it, but music was a big part of, of sure. our home. Yeah, you know. and that's enough. I mean, it doesn't yeah. show, but oh, no yeah. early lessons. Little Ken wasn't sitting at the piano playing. Well, it did start pretty early for me. I mean, the first thing I ever sang was Easter Parade in kindergarten. Of course you did. <laughs> I was the voice of a puppet who actually, believe it or not, narrated a fashion show. The little girls wore their Easter outfits and my yep. little puppet, you know, was like, oh, here comes Cindy and she's wearing a dress that's pink and has black. I don't oh, know where I got that from, but there it was. And you probably and won I, an award for it as yes, well. I, yeah. <laughs> and I came from behind the puppet stage and I sang Easter Parade with the little girls on each side. So it was like a Ziegfeld number. <laughs> that is so great. So you knew and, uh, at a young age. Yeah, and, and then, in first grade, you know, I remember I sang a song uh, in first grade called Why Do We Tip Our Hats to the Priest, which I remember to this day, believe it or not. But that, so early on, I was, I should note, the reason, moreover, was because I had a cousin who's three years older than me, and he was already doing speech. He took tap lessons, piano lessons. He was a okay. cathedral boys choir. Yeah. So all of these things were there, and that thing that we don't often have, which is knowing they exist, yep, and knowing that they're part. There's something that you can actually be part of. Uh, the school that I went to didn't have a lot of those things, but I knew that they existed. And then by the time I was in fifth grade at the other new school, uh, a wonderful teacher, Sister Ruth Cecilia, who later left the convent. But at any rate, she came to our school two, three years before that, two years before that, we had been being bused, if you will. It was a station wagon, but uh -huh. to her school, which was an all white school, an all white area, to be in her chorus, which was called the Marian Choristers. We would go there on Fridays and rehearse with the choir and so on and so forth. Then at Easter and Christmas, we would do concerts with them at that school. Right. Well, come two years later, they transferred her to our school. And yeah. we didn't have any kind of music or drama or anything like that. And she came to the school and she inaugurated a music program. She went out and begged up instruments, uh, begged yeah. up musicians to teach them. The first show we did in my grade school, I was in eighth grade by this point. And I always love to say this because it tells you where she was and where we did Snow White. Now, mind you, this was an all black school, right? She was yeah. a rebel, you know, she was like, why can't we do Snow White? And people are like, that well, is one. Isn't that great? They were yeah. like, well, Sister Ruth, it's all Snow White. She said, it's a story. Why can't we tell it? And well, that and was the first seeds I had planted in my brain about what was possible. Well, that's the thing. And, and you're absolutely correct. And you're correct because you know, and nobody, yes. you know, you've lived this. And if a door is open for you, I don't have to take these kids that we, um, that we teach and mentor and show them the exact way. I just have to show them the possibility. That's right. And the whole point is that um, Marvin Hamlish said in an interview, and it really struck me, he said, well, we're missing a lot of talent out there because the kids that are getting the lessons and seeing what they can do, that's wonderful. But you know how many kids out there don't, don't know any. what they can do? And right. so the and they can. They can, and the ASA is trying to level that playing field as much as we can. Yeah. It's a big, it's a tall order. But at well, least you know what? Nothing uh, succeeds like ex not excess, but success. I mean, so, the fact that you're doing that's a, a doubt. That was my line. mantra from before <laughs> my thirties. Nothing, nothing succeeds like excess. Yeah, and yeah. it did then, right? <laughs> it did. Um, but the idea that you're doing it, there's nothing more you can do but to do it. That's you right. You know, there's nothing that's to it right. but to do it. 
that uh, well. if you're not, yeah, and if you're not doing it, then it cannot be. So the fact right. that you're there and you're making the effort, even if it's a mountain to climb in a tall order, every mountain is climbed one foot at a time, and you have to start or you never get to the top. Well, so and then that's the eight people like you who go well, you out know, there and the know thing. and know it completely, you know, and say, all right, I can, you know, it's just huge. And I, I've got this wonderful interview that you had, you were given a lifetime achievement award and there's some wonderful speaking that you do about the mentors in your life and about this high school program that you sort of turned around. I think it was supposed to be more of a community service. Type yes, of deal. yes, it was. And then Ken Page got involved at the age of what, 14? Uh, probably 15, yeah, somewhere around there. Okay. Sophomore, junior year in high school, yeah. Well, this just kills me and I'm gonna play it because I'm just oh, crazy okay. about it, okay. I was very fortunate to work at a time with people who were the masters of this. That's not it. This is it. We still <laughs> did outreach because what we would do is that we would put on a play and we would get uh, uh, buses to bring the inner city kids in to see them because I had been those kids. The first time I saw him audition, people were astounded. And they kept looking at each other and said, wow, that kid is only 15. I think I've done almost not all certainly but I've, I've done so many of the character roles in the classic music theater canon and they were roles that a lot of people don't get to play specifically african-american male actors and then of course been fortunate enough to create a few so there's that but when i think about high school the reason that stays with me is because i think it set the template that i would say for what i would do later it had all to do with being uh, cast in the ensemble at the Muni. That had gone from my being in, in high school musicals to being a music theater major in college to working professionally. And that was sort of the gateway in. He was just ready from the first time we met him. He had something that you don't, you don't teach. And Don Garner, uh, my colleague, had come to us from New York having been in professional theater all his life and he encouraged um, Ken knowing that he was ready. I mean that he really couldn't wait at that point. He said look go while you have the fire. The first job I actually got in the city was with a, a children's theater. Wonderful amazing people who were the salt of the earth theater people. And when I did Guys and Dolls I came out one night and there was this couple sort of standing off to the side and I was signing autographs and so forth. And I looked over and they kind of waved and that. And I looked and it was Joan and Evan. So I went to them, you know, I said, I had a big hug. I hadn't seen them in a couple of years, three years. So. And with tears in her eyes, she said to me, she goes, we didn't know if you'd remember us. I said, I'm still doing what I'm doing because of you. It's pretty wonderful. Pretty yeah. wonderful that you had so many people believing you at such, yeah. in you at such a young age. I was very then, fortunate. Yeah, and then um, were there, I'm curious about being in a, in a Catholic school in St. Louis, Missouri, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Were there other boys that were interested in musical theater? Were there other kids that were finding their way that way? Well, from the grade school, I had my best friend, God rest him, Luther Clark. His mother actually was the first person that took me to see a professional show at the Muni. We went uh -huh. to see Oklahoma. At the Muni, which is your home. Muni. And yeah. we sat in the free seats and I saw Robert Horton do Oklahoma. Oh boy. My first show. He came out on a real horse, which is, that's the Muni, right? You're right. But also the first time I saw uh, African-American performers on stage was when Pearl Bailey and Cab Calloway did mm -hmm. the all black uh, iteration, if you will, of, of Hello Dolly. And they brought yeah. the show in from New York and it played there for a week or so. Uh, but I, Luther and I were sort of, like brothers. I mean, you know, we did the musical things together. And this is grade school, mind you. We also went to the same high school. For right. instance, senior year in high school, I was Tevya and he was Laser Wolf. <laughs> I love this so much. So yeah, you, yeah, up, yeah. you get a full scholarship to college. Yes. And on a theater scholarship. So it was an arts scholarship. And uh, thinking, of course, that you can play any damn role you want to. Tell me about growing into that. Did the casting change when you were in, in, um, in college? No, you know, I mean, that's one of the things I don't think I realized until later. Uh, certainly New York taught me more of that. But, yeah. you know, 
I realized that I would had this really sort of a hybrid uh, trajectory into the arts because I always, from high school on, was doing roles that weren't traditionally cast by in with African Americans. Yeah, but it was never. I mean, there was controversy around them many times. You know, we did Hello Dolly in high school. There was controversy of having a black Horace and a white Dolly. Needless yeah. to say, Fiddler on the Roof was like, should we as a Catholic school be doing Fiddler on the Roof at all? I, right? I love that you did. I would love And to then there's it. a black Tevye on top of everything. So I always had this thing of just doing roles. The first yeah. role I did in college, I played Henry VIII in a, a wonderful play called Royal Gambit. Mm -hmm. So right away, I, Dark of the Moon, I played Preacher Hagler, uh, She Stoops to Conquer, you know, wow. things that were always uh, open to me because of my ability. Abilities, and right. I wasn't uh, parenthesis because of my race. So I went into professional theater with all of that um, confidence. That's amazing, yeah. yeah. And and so uh, you went right from college to New York. You basically with nothing but a dance belt and a tube of chapstick. That's, that's right. <laughs> that's very funny. <laughs> and that's all you needed. You that's know? from waiting for guff minutes. My I know, I guess. the whole world. Practically. Yes. Practically. Yeah. Funny, just a side story. My grandmother told me when I took the train to New York with my good friend Carol Bosch, uh, my I had five hundred dollars and she oh. said, put it in your underwear. I dance belt, quote it, you know. Yes. Put it in yes. your underwear because if anybody gets in there and gets the money, you deserve to lose it. <laughs> that is hilarious. Isn't that the best? I love that. God bless her. She oh, and she really wonderful. said that. She yeah, said, oh, put I your bet. money in your underwear. Yeah. And I was like, in my underwear? She said, that's right. Because nobody should be in there but you. That's and if anybody right. else is in there, well, there you go. You then know. you deserve to lose it. You deserve it all. to lose it. Yeah. That yeah. is wonderful. So, what was your experience like when you first got to New York? What did you think of the city? It was exactly as I thought. I had read, interestingly enough, and I came into living on the Upper West Side. Mm -hmm. I had read a novelization of West Side Story, ah. uh, which, of course, was more descriptive. They talked about, you know, the the seventies, uh, the sixties, and the seventies, the uh, the area, the actual area that was yeah. the background. That's so right. when I got to New York and came into that as my living area. It was exactly the way I thought it would be. Now, mind you, I'm a kid who grew up, you know, with stars in my eyes about New York from the time yep. what Broadway was. So I was very educated to what I thought it was, right? The right. good news was it was exactly as I thought it was. And many probably know that New York, I got there in 70, late 74, somewhere, 74. Right. Fall 74, was uh, a little dangerous during those years, 74, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Oh, yeah. And it was a little dicey. Very, yeah, and yet people are very nostalgic for that time. Well, it you know what? Because even though it was dangerous, it was completely and very alive. Yes. It was very visceral. You know, 42nd Street was like, if you don't need to go between 8th and 9th, probably 10th, go around. Go to That's 41st, right. go to 43rd, skip 42nd Street. Because it was really, I think, more than dangerous it was you didn't have any business there unless you had some business there. Exactly. And whatever well, business you could have there was. <laughs> that's absolutely right. It's true. And we didn't have no business there. So, you yeah. know, it was like, but the whole city was kind of like that. When I it came into, I was living on 73rd Street and right at the end of the block there, the 72nd Street stop was a thing that no longer exists called Needle Park. Well, I didn't oh, know what that yeah, was, yeah. Yep. but that's where all the people who, you know, shot up, whatever, they all gathered there in that little meridian there. And you had to cross through there all the time. But I mean, look, I was 20 years old. It was all glamorous and amazing to me. It was New York City. That's so to right. me, the reality of it was exactly as I thought. And to be honest, hoped it would be. Yeah. Had it been any safer and any more homogenized, I think I would have been disappointed. Well, and it didn't take you long. It took you less than a year to be cast in your first show, which was Guys and Dolls, because now I'm in the know. Yes. Yeah, exactly. So 1976, <laughs> yeah. 1976, all right. So um, in between moving there and and being cast in that show, did you take lessons? Did you get yourself a manager? Did you just audition like crazy? What did you do in that time? Well, you know, I was, again, very fortunate. I got there, and as, I, so, as you saw in the clip, I worked with this children's theater ensemble called the Fanfare Children's Theater Ensemble. Right. 
Yeah. And we did Huckleberry Finn. I obviously was Jim. Oh. <laughs> Not all the you know, the non-traditional casting stopped there. I'm in New right, York. Right, right. And uh, we went on tour the Upper East Coast, uh, what they call it, Basin or whatever. We did yeah. Baltimore and up in Vermont, places like that. The furthest west we went was Detroit, where The Wiz was in its pre-Broadway, by the way. Ah. And okay. I saw it there. Uh, so I did that. And then I did uh, 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 the wonderful musical Pearly at a place, mm -hmm. of course, that no longer did uh, it's Coconut Grove Playhouse in Florida, right. Right. Yeah, which was one. It was the best job you could get in the winter in New York because you went yeah. to Florida and exactly. you played at the Coconut Grove. And out of that, they decided to take that tour to Los Angeles for the first time. It had not played okay. in Los Angeles. So we became the Los Angeles premiere. And coming back after that was when I did Guys and Dolls. So okay. basically, that's what I did in between. And I should say, I did work at the Department of Social Services for like 25 minutes before yeah. I did <laughs> before I did uh, Huckleberry Finn. And then, bless this guy, I'll never forget him. He said, I, I want to hire you because it was a temp thing, you know. He says, yeah. but you actors, you take the jobs and then you leave because you go act. And I thought, I'm not leaving. I'm going to stay. Yeah. I'm going to do it. And it and he was very kind, and he started teaching me lots of things about the Xerox machines. And, uh -huh. and then I got cast in Huckleberry Finn, and I had to come and tell him, I, like every other actor, <laughs> have been cast in a show, and I'm out of here, you know. And he went, <laughs> oh, see, I knew it, I knew it. Yeah, so what right. I did was when I opened, this was when I went out to do Children's Theater, but when I opened on Broadway, I went and I offered him a ticket because I said, I just want you to understand that I didn't, I didn't leave for nothing. You know. Right. Oh, that's yeah. wonderful. So tell yeah. me about uh, originating a role in a, in a Broadway musical is pretty exciting stuff, and particularly when it is as incredibly successful as Ain't Misbehaving was, is. I mean, everybody still clamors for that music. It is a big... I'm directing it in three weeks. I go to direct it out on the West Coast. It Which continues. Is, yeah, it really does continue. I actually have a clip that I'm going to play. It's you and Andre DeShields. Ah, and I love it so much, but what makes me smile and the reason why I wanted to play it is because this was at 54 Below, just sort of coming back together. And, and it yeah. was so wonderful and that you can just feel everybody's so happy to yeah. hear this music always. I'm going to go ahead and play this clip now. Okay. okay. Oh, rather abruptly. I see I get all up into it. I'm seeing Well, you know it what's funny? Happened. For me watching it was frozen. It kept jumping and skipping. So I still didn't, oh. I didn't know that existed. I never really? knew there was a video of it. Well, oh, know. I'll send you the whole darn thing. I think that would be funny. wonderful. That's yeah. great. And I was like, oh I'm gonna get to see it and it was like uh, 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 uh. So, oh no so weird. I, I hope it wasn't that way for the other folks watching. If it was go ahead and comment and let me know. Yeah. Um I will say that uh when I was a little not that little. I wasn't that little, but, but mm -hmm. we moved from Austin, Texas, where my dad had had a job as the headmaster of a little school there. And we moved to New Jersey. And the best thing about it was being able to take the train in and go see theater. But I didn't really know about it until he came back from a business lunch and said, somebody had, somebody said, let's go see this show. And he saw you and flipped out, brought the entire family. And I ended up seeing it twice. He ended up seeing it three times. And it was just uh, an absolute delight. It's happy music. It's wonderful music. It's fun. So so tell me about, now you moved from New York after just this, you never stopped working all the way through. And then all of a sudden, 
I see sort of a detour into a lot of voiceover work. I mean, particularly the voice of Oogie Boogie, which any kid, my kid, all kids know. Did you move to LA? I did. I had done Cats. And by this point, I had done Pearly in LA. And yep. I also done Ain't Misbehaving in LA. So I'd yep. had LA, you know, sort of experiences and so forth. And, yep. you know, this was my, I think, fourth Broadway show. And there were options to do, they were doing Three Musketeers, and I could have done that. And there was another show, uh, the first music by Jackie Robinson. But mm -hmm. I was in Cats, and I thought, well, that's the e-ticket ride. You don't get, <laughs> you know, I'm staying there. I'm not going anywhere. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, and then I decided Milton Goldman, who was my agent at the time, uh, I said, you know, I think I want to go to California and give it a shot. Because I had been brought out there when I did Guys and Dolls to do a series. They brought me out to meet with Milt Hammerman, who was the head of uh, uh, Universal. Yeah. And I got there, and they realized I was 21 years old. They thought I was a lot older from seeing the show. Right. You know, and they were like, you can't play the guy who you know, like uh, runs the house with all these college kids. You're a college kid. Right. I said, well, like, I'll wear everything. They said, no, for TV, you can't wear gray in your hair and you can't do it. No, I don't it's have to. Totally I have it. In it. Totally but different. so, yeah. So that was my first brush with California. And it was pretty close, but I was too young, you know. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, when I decided after Cats that I wanted to go give it a try, it also coincided with the fact that a lot of my peer group had moved there. Yeah. You know, I was sort of left in New York doing cats, which was great, but all of my friends had moved to California. Yeah. And I thought, well, let me go and see what I what kind of dust I can kick up out there and see. Absolutely. So the other things, uh, Nightmare Before Christmas came from being there. And interestingly enough, that was connected through my wonderful friend and lawyer, Mark Sindroff, who also represented Danny Elfman. A wonderful guy. Yep. Yeah, he's a sweetheart. And you know, it was a thing of we're looking for fats waller cap Callaway, kind of blah blah. And he said, Do I have the guy for you? Right. And right. that's how it sort of germinated. But I was already in California, and uh, that's kind of how it happened. But the okay. reason for going was I just also, you know, to be more specific, I wanted to do, and I love the theater. Everybody knows me, knows that. But I wanted to do things that would be there forever. The, what, the one thing you have out of theater that lasts generally is the Broadway cast album. Mm -hmm. Other than that, it goes away into the, you know, ethereal, ephemera, whatever. But for, I wanted to do things where, you know, a lot of shows I've done, people had followed me very closely. And yes. I thought, I want to do something where it's just me and it's there forever and it's signature and so forth. So That's I thought the best way to do that is put it on film or be on television. And that way it's you. It's not three people that look like you, that sound like you, that act like you. It's just you. And yeah. I wanted to do that not only for myself and my career, but I also for posterity, I wanted to have things out there that were signature of what I did and do. Right. So California. Well, and I don't know, um, there are so many debates about what I'm going to say next, mm -hmm. but it's very interesting because I've seen a lot of um, film actors and then one of the only ways that they can keep houses full, right, on Broadway now, unfortunately, is to get a television star yeah. or a series regular right. um, into, you know, Chicago does it constantly and into and from film. Right. And you see a lot of people that are um, are very uh, adequate in film and television that cannot translate at all right. to the to the stage. Sure. But you don't see that quite as much. Sometimes there's it's just very very different. I mean, did you find that it was they were completely separate experiences um, in terms of acting for film and television than for for the stage? Yeah. Well, yes, but when you come into it via maybe sitcoms, yep. it's a little bit closer to theater. You do it in front of a live audience, and That's it's a right. little broader. It's a little more breadth in it than uh, I did do episodic work and so forth. But by then, I'd gotten used to working on camera and blah, blah, blah. So it was right, easy. Well, but I agree that, um, and in fact, you know, there are many people, when we think about Ethel Merman and people that were signature to the theater, sure. they didn't translate to film quite so well because they Not were big. Well. Yeah, and that was oh, what they yeah. did, you know, and they had to turn the mics down and everything. Mm -hmm. um, but I think you're absolutely right. And I would agree with you that now, and I don't apologize for saying this, just about anybody who has a name can probably get a shot at doing Broadway because that's of the right. economics. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And so and many of the people on both sides of that issue, some of them came from theater. Nobody knows that. So they That's come right. back to the theater and like, no, this is how I started. This is what I did in the first place. And then yep. they're great or they're at least they know what they're doing. Others have had no experience on stage whatsoever. 
they're up there because they will bring tickets in. Mm -hmm. And it has changed the landscape for theater people because people come out of all of these wonderful schools where they've been trained and they get there and Joe Blow from such and such sitcom gets the role because he has box office and they've That's trained right. for six or eight years and they can't get the part. So it's tricky. It's tricky. And it comes down to, doesn't it, the almighty dollar? I mean, these theaters have to stay open. They have sure. to run. They have to... Uh, the question is always how much is enough, but the truth is too, yeah. I think if you're going to go ahead and buy a ticket or somebody treats you to a ticket or whatever, the best thing you can possibly do is go, and I'm saying this to the kids that are out there, yeah. is go to the theater unbiased. Try really, really hard because sometimes I have gone to go see, uh, I'm not even, I won't fill in any names, but somebody playing the role of somebody on Broadway and she comes from the television sitcom and she's fabulous exactly. she's fierce exactly. and filled with charisma and not what i expected yeah. that's a great experience yeah and i fun. think that's i want to say and i don't know if i'm right but that's more the case because again i reemphasize that a lot of people who go to hollywood and do film and television they have theater backgrounds they yeah. have theater training but they got their success there and they come back to broadway and they're like oh i'm home where people right. think well you know there's somebody from such a such sitcom they don't know anything they're rotten they're awful and you go in there, like you said, and they're like, I'm home again. This is what I really know. Yeah. And they're terrific. Yes. You know, we pray well, that's more the case. And exactly. And home, this is a good question. So when you've, you've lived, you lived in New York for a long time. You lived in L.A. for a pretty long time. Right. And you're back in St. Louis. Does St. Louis really feel like what what had you move from L.A. back to St. Louis? What was the impetus for that? Uh, you know, elders. My parents were getting older. Yep. And uh, it was getting to the point where I, I felt not only my parents, but other relatives, uh, my aunt, I am sort of responsible for her business thing. She suffers with Alzheimer's and so forth. But I mm -hmm. knew they needed help. Yeah. And, you know, to be perfectly honest, I'd, sort of, I'd gone twice around with New York and L.A., twice yeah. around. And yeah. I got to the point where I thought, you know what? And this is a whole nother story, but. I had just kind of had enough of LA, you know, it, mm -hmm. it's a different animal and you have to do different things. Absolutely. And I thought, I want to not do this. <laughs> I want to go somewhere where I can breathe. And, and yeah. I didn't want to go back to New York for the third time. And I thought, let me just go home to St. Louis and settle in and calm down and help my parents and my relatives and see what happens. I did take into account that I was in the middle of the country and I could get to New York in two hours. I could get to L.A. in three hours. New York was more the option because you can go and do. In L.A., you kind of have to be there on the moment. They call you That's at right. nine That's in the morning. They want to see you at one and you got the sides coming. You know, yeah. you got to learn it. You can't do that from long distance. But that was my roll of the dice and my uh, compromise was to be somewhere where my spirit felt more uh, at ease. And I was of service to family. And I could still keep working because I was doing my own show, concerts, things, and they were booked all over the country and voiceover things that were still possible and working. Even a lot of the things I've done subsequently for Nightmare Before Christmas, I've recorded the majority, I'd say 98% of it I've recorded in St. Louis. And that's oh, the Disney really? parks. Yeah, yeah, the Disney yeah. parks and everything. So, you know, I had a pretty good go for being somewhere other than the two places. Um, well, and, you know, a lot of people, you know, it's very funny because you hear a lot of uh, cliches about youth is wasted on the young. And I disagree. I think that um, just as your one mentor said to you that you revealed in that interview that I played the clip from which I played the clip, mm -hmm. you know, they said, go to New York now while you've got that fire in your belly. And when you're yeah. in your 20s, it's the place to be. Right. And oh, then yeah. you, you're, you follow your gut if you I think if one is smart and one is good follows your gut and it took you then to LA. Your friends yeah. were there and that's important. Where yeah. your love is, where your, you know, uh, it's, it's, your it's tribe is. Important. Yeah. I exactly. always, I've always followed my instincts, mm -hmm. always. Going mm -hmm. to New York, I went, because people thought I was too shy and I wouldn't be able to deal with it. And I was like, you shy. know what I know. Yeah, shy. You shy. You yeah, but they really did. They thought I was too shy because I was very quiet. I'm not a boisterous one of those people that walks in yeah, the yeah. and throws their hands in the air and goes, I'm here. I'm yeah, not yeah, that yeah. person. Oh, I shrink into the corner and I don't want to, you know, I don't even like yeah. to sing at parties. None of that kind of, you know. Yeah, um, I don't either. But I've always, I know it's always feels like you're doing a show. and I, it, Right. I, have you ever been to a party where everybody's gathered around the piano and everybody takes a song? And I think, oh, 
Can't no. stand it. Uh, no. Uh, no. I'm I always like, ease out yeah. the door. I do, literally. Uh, or, I just like, back oh, up. Really? You know, I'm. <laughs> yeah, people go, are you leaving? I go, shh. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm just going to exit. Help. Because I'm not comfortable. I'm never comfortable doing that. Never. Yeah, it's it's very strange. I've never liked it either. But then, and then you get to an age, especially when you, you know, it's incredible. As a mother, I I am heartened by the fact that eventually your children really do see you in a different way. And you saw your parents are getting older and that they needed help. And there's a natural time in life to say, okay, you know, now I'm going to do that. And I just, what I want to tell my students especially or anybody watching is go with your gut. If your gut is pulling you towards not something, not to avoid something you might be a little frightened of, or but really because your heart is pulling you there. Absolutely. And, it's- and also I would add to that, that oftentimes your, your instincts, your gut is telling you, even though you're frightened, this is what you should do. That's right. That's and if right. you follow that, you can't, I feel, this is my statement, I would say, if you follow your instincts and your gut from day one, whatever that, you cannot go wrong. You can only do what's there to be done. You right. can't go wrong if you're following your own instincts. And, that. and when you make uh, the choices that we make, for me, from day one, it was always life and career. It wasn't just career. I always honored my life yeah. more than my career. My That's career right. was part of my life. It wasn't my whole life. And I mean, you know, there are people, I think, who excel on a certain level because their careers are their whole life. I think there's a, you know, we see that. But for me, it just never was that way. I always felt like this is great, but I still want to go home for Thanksgiving. <laughs> you know right. what I mean? I want right. to go home and eat my grandmother's yeah, turkey. Right. I want to eat my mother's this and that, banana pudding. That's uh, a- <laughs> yeah. And it well, was always important. Yeah. And the and concept, too, friends. that, yes. And and the concept, too, that things, things end. You know, things and relationships gently fizzle out. It's very rare that you have. I have a couple of friends that I had since I was little. That's rare, I think. Very rare. And I'm so blessed there. I have two friends that I've known, one since third grade, first grade. Mm -hmm. We went Uh first, second, and third grade together. And she was an old rock. She is still kind of a rock and roll chick. She sang back up for Sting. And oh, Poli I and all these love people. it. Yeah, she lived in London for a few years. But we can still talk about Sister Mary of the Holy Child, who was our first grade teacher. Yeah, you know? yeah like and it's the yesterday. best. And there's I, I no... want to hear more about Sister Mary of the Holy Child. Holy Child, she, yes. She left yes. the order, and I want to know where she went. But we'll talk. Well, that's about another. That. That's another nun. Yeah. Oh, oh, that's another nun. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I have some questions that um, yes. that were uh, put together by our kids. And mm-hmm. one of them is, do you have a pet? I do not have a pet. When you I travel. lived in California, I traveled. Yeah. That's the yeah. When I lived in LA, I did. I had I had two different uh, dogs at different times. One I saved from being put to sleep. She was twenty yeah. minutes from being euthanized, and oh. I named her Twenty because she was twenty. <laughs> and this friend of mine who was an animal person said, "Oh, she's adorable. She's this. She's that. Can you take her?" I said, "Yes." And he said, oh, she's like two, three years old. I thought, okay, all right, that's it. And she was a beautiful uh, uh, Cocker Spaniel. Uh She came to my house. She took to me immediately. But friends came over and they said, Paige, how old did you say this dog is? I said, she's two. Barry said she's two. They said, this is an old dog. Yeah, they gave you, yeah. yeah. So she was tremendously protective of me, but she wouldn't let anyone near me. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. I mean, she really, you know, so she, of course, it, well, it could be yeah. great because she yeah. came from a lady who went into di- dialysis and yeah. she was the pet of an older person and they needed that. For yeah. me, I had people in and out of the house constantly. And she was like, get these people out of it. You know, she couldn't yeah. take it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So she had to go. Then I got another dog who was wonderful. Long story short, it became clear that I worked too much and I was not there enough to really sure. take care of a pet. So I haven't had one since then. Because uh, now more than ever, I'm traveling and it would just be too much of a responsibility. Yeah, no, I totally get it. And the, and I was saying, I the shelter people, they're wonderful, salt to the earth. They lie, lie, lie. Yes, yes, I, yes. I took on a dog and I they said, how old is your exist? I had a dog already. And I said, well, he's six. And they said, so is she. She was nine. <laughs> she lived another nine years, but it was just like they will say anything. To anything, the absolutely, adopted. absolutely. And All I right. should make a footnote that Twenty went to another woman, another a, a lady, other than the person yeah. who was alone and had lost her pet. Her pet had passed right. away, and she was heartbroken because she didn't have a pet. And a friend of mine said, 
I think this is a good fit. And I said, that's because yeah. that's what the dog was used to. And yeah. I was told later that the woman was like, oh, this is the perfect, you know, because she just took to her right away. Well, 20 it's got a happy 60. ending. Yeah, 20 yeah. got 60 times over. That's the right. Exactly. Here's another one for you. Did you ever want kids? Um, yes and no. I would say yes. I There was a time and still I think about it because I'm, I'm too old to start now. But I've been very fortunate that I have nieces, nephews. I have several godchildren, and I'm I'm a pretty hands-on if they're near enough to me or whatever. So I, I now realize all these years I've actually had children, and I say this to you: I didn't have to raise them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I had them. I've yeah. been more like obviously a godfather, uncle. But I've come in at times when it was very, you know, I'd show up like I remember my my goddaughter was having a little trouble in college. She's a dance major at UCLA, and her mother and I have known each other for years. And she said she's quit. She wants to quit. She's two six months from graduation. Uh -huh. She needs to talk to her godfather. So I yeah. flew to California, and I we went to dinner. And she was like, she was being ambushed. It was so funny because she was prepared. She was like, yeah. I'm yeah. not she's going ready. to. Yeah. And I just did, you know, what the godfather should do. I said, look, I'm not judging you. I'm just saying, do you know the facts that your parents don't owe you anything anymore now? You should regret whatever you're going to do. You won't have a degree, blah, blah, blah. All the facts I ran down. And I felt really good in that instance because I felt this is these are this is what my thing for my children is. Absolutely. When I come in, you know, uh, I adore babies. Yeah. I just, every baby, airport, and I always say they look at me and they think I'm a talking stuffed animal. They, they must like to, love it. That's they, right. They really do. They look at, they're fascinated. They just, <laughs> and they stare Babies, at me. They're just and goofy I, little, honest oh, people. Oh, they're just, you know, I always say to my friends who have, who have had children from birth, I say to them, they're the closest thing to heaven will know on earth. That's it. That's it. And there's a wonderful story. And I'm just going to tell you the end, yeah. but a little two-year-old brother that had been desperate to talk to his infant sister just born. And the parents were like, this is so weird. He wants to be left alone with this infant. And they finally do it. They let him. And he goes over to her and looks over her crib and says, what is it like? I'm starting to forget. I've heard that. And it that just it just gets you, you know. Well, because you know they know more coming here. I think I think it's a process of forgetting. Yeah. You know, they forget into their human life, so to speak. But That's when right. they're born, I think they know a lot. They don't know how to talk to you about it. I had another friend, a friend, who's one day her son just said, Sharon Haley, wonderful choreographer. Uh -huh. Her son said, you know, I used to be able to fly. And she said, where did you fly? You know? yeah. <laughs> he says, before I was born, I could fly. Yeah. And she said, well, where were you? And he's playing with his car, you know, a kid. And he said, I don't want to talk about it anymore. Yeah. And you know what? If they could tell us, if they could tell us, we couldn't hear it anyway. So That's it's right. one of those we things. But I do want to say that the mentors that uh, mo the lion's share of the mentors for the ASA that are able to spend some time and give some help to these kids are not parents. Parents are too busy. Parents yeah. have too much going on. There's too much in their brain about their own children. Right, and sure. it, is, it has taken me. I have a village of people around my son. Um, yes. And whether or not this is about my personality or not, but it's predominantly gay male actors mm -hmm. who have contributed so much to his life. Absolutely. Who have been there to have that conversation. And they've got the, uh, because they're not dealing with kids all day. You know, right. the ability to really focus in on them and say, I see you. So that's that's yeah. absolutely wonderful. And then there's another one. Somebody wants to know, do you have a favorite film or, or movie? They said movie. Movie. A favorite? To, to see. To see. To see. To see. Well, you know what? I have several and I could name them all. But I'm um, going to promote this one right now because I think it has such a great cultural uh, significance and voice right now. Elvis. Yeah. And there are many people who think, Elvis, really? I mean, wasn't he, you know, I said, listen, this is the thing. I always go into everything to decide for myself. I don't take what people tell me about anything. I want to know yeah. for myself. This film, it's probably my favorite for a while it'll be because it, it really tells the truth. I'll bring it into one. It tells a truth. I'll put it that way about, mm -hmm. you know, we all, that was the king, da, 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 da. but there's been pieces extracted from the background of what that means and so forth. And this movie restores it. I won't say it's never been said, but I knew stories from my cultural upbringing as an African-American that were not necessarily very supportive of Elvis. 
because it was said he'd appropriated and he was this, he was that. Well, what this movie has said, which I think is so great for everybody, is that mm -hmm. he was echoing what he knew. He came out of, and I say this loudly, he came yeah. out of Black culture. He grew up with Black people. He came out of Black culture. He, the music was his, it wasn't something he appropriated. Yeah. It was something he brought out into the world. And white America might have been hearing it for the first time. Oh, from they were white clutching American. their pearls and completely oh titillated. You know, yeah. all the stuff, the whole story of how, you know, people weren't having him for a while. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. I've seen it a couple of times. And I think it's an important film, not only if you love Elvis, but it's yeah. an important film is it's another American story that is being righted. That's yeah. how I put it. And I no. think it's an important page in our history to know about that. So I love that. And my other wonderful movie I love is Under the Tuscan Sun. Oh, yes. 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 yes that's right. Where go. That's where we're going. Have you that's been where we're Tuscany? going. Absolutely. Have you been? Pardon me? Have you Tuscany? been to Tuscany? I have not. I've, I've been to Rome. I have not been to Tuscany. Oh, yet. my goodness. It's, it is just as wonderful as it. I mean, it's I, just That's what fabulous. everyone tells me. And they said, if you can, rent a villa, take some friends, yep. go and just soak it in. Yep. You know, eat relax, food, eat food, food drink wine. Wonderful. That's yeah. right. That's right. I and cannot the book, wait. I liked the book, but I always really like it when the film is as beautiful as the book. Well, you know, and they really I had a, got it. a fortunate experience. I met Audrey Wells, who since passed away, who wrote who wrote the screenplay and directed the film. Yeah. And she said she put two stories together. We know the book is about, you know, Francis, uh, I forget the last name, but mm -hmm. her experiences and recipes and things like that. Yes. She took another story, which is about a divorcee who then goes to Europe and rekindles oh, and her life. She put though. them both together. And yeah. that's how you have what the film of it is. Um, and beautiful. Because w the reason I love it, not only Tuscany is enough, but it tells you, you never know what's in store for you. Sometimes you got to you got to get off the bus and take the that's chance. Right. And your whole life is then in front of you. And take, go with your gut. Don't do go something. Go with your gut. Else, but take risks, you know, take, go on that trip, eat that new right. food, That's sing right. that new tune. If somebody says that has a good head on their shoulders and says, I see this for you. Try yeah. it on, right? Try it. And you, that's right. Yeah. And to me, that's life. And if you stop doing that, you're abbreviating your life in probably the most significant way you could. Yeah. Whether it's going to Tuscany, whether it's buying a villa, whether it's walking down this street and not that street, singing that song and not that song. Right. Every moment you can make choices that can enhance your life. Well, I could sit here and chat with you for another three hours, but I'm yes. done realizing that the time has flown by. And the last question I am always asking is, what's what's coming? What's up next? Do you know? Do you have anything planned? Uh, you, well, I'll start by saying, since I've been graciously put on the cover of Cabaret News, that oh. I'm returning to 54 Below next May. Same night, same date, a year later, May 4th, May 2023. 4th. Yeah. That is so exciting. And I was going to do it earlier, but I thought, nah, let's put it out there further and let's see what life affords in the in between and come there back. There you go. Well, I, I will can't be wait. There. I'll yes. Definitely yes. be there. Yeah. yeah. How wonderful. And hopefully, God willing, and everything goes the way it we hope it will, I'm doing again concerts at Wembley Arena in London in December Excellent. of Nightmare Before Christmas Live and, and directing oh. Amos for Haven in four weeks and on and on. And on. Yeah, so I'm, so lots I'm of busy. Stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But luckily busy. Well, I'm glad, and I hope that you stay cool. I hope that the um, <laughs> I hope that the directing gig with Aunt Miss Haven goes beautifully well. I know Thank that you. it will, Thank you. Thank you. and uh, I cannot wait to see you again. Yes, and, so and we'll happy. run into each other's arms like we did the first time. That's right. That's right. And I'm still holding you for that meal. I'm not That's letting all. you off the hook. I will cook, and now it has to be in Tuscany. So yes, go. let's do it. Why not, Ken Page? This has been a delight. Thank you so uh, much. Thank pleasure. you for agreeing to be on the cover. Yes, Everybody, thank you for putting me on the cover. Yeah, tell these people it's sixty-five dollars to become a member of the ASA, Absolutely. and you get a free subscription for a year yes. to Cabaret Scenes as a benefit of membership. Yeah. So and do it. Wonderful information in there about Cabaret all over the planet. And That's it's right. Great. You know, it's it's a worthy investment. Absolutely. It's lots of fun. And you are lots of fun. Thank you so much, Ken Page, for being here. I adore you. Mwah. That gotcha. 
So, and thank you for being here with us. Instead of having Ken sing us off, I'm actually going to have him speak us off because I got to watch this wonderful footage of uh, Ken being interviewed um, because he was the recipient of a Lifetime Achievement Award, one of many I know that are in store for him. Um, and this absolutely encapsulates why the American Songbook Association does what it does in terms of education and mentoring for kids pre-K through the senior year. It's not about creating performers. It's about feeding and expanding minds. And the American Songbook, jazz, uh, musical theater, and classic American song, old and new, it's still being written, um, it's a teaching tool to get these kids to come out of themselves or to expand themselves and really see what they can possibly do. Um, and this is uh, a very short clip from a Ken Page interview. I'm Carolyn Montgomery. I'm so grateful that you're here and I'll see you next time. We still did outreach because what we would do is that we would put on a play. And I put on the wrong clip again. This is the clip that we want. And it's Ken Page, and I'm saying goodbye for the final time. I was very fortunate to work at a time with people who were the masters of the art form and trade. Arthur Mitchell, Alvin Ailey lived in my building, two floors above me, uh, Jeffrey Holder. These are all people that I lived and worked with in my youth and lifetime. And I learned things from them. And in truth, if you don't pass them on, they die. It's just that simple, you know.